Hello everyone, it's that girl G and I'm back here with a new video and as you might see it's quite different from the videos that I've been doing so far because I'm not playing games, I'm gonna be talking about things that I wish I knew before I moved to the UK, things about this place that uh, really shocked me when I got here. They're not necessarily bad things, although they are mostly my link inconvenience some of them, but they're just things that I kind of wish I was more prepared you know, to face when I got here. I'm gonna start with things at UK houses, at British houses, that kind of shock me. And I'm gonna start with the bathroom, because I think that's where they mostly, you know, they all get together. And in the bathroom, I'm gonna talk about showers. Now, most people are used to, I think most people in most countries are used to what's called here a mixer shower. And it's just... Your normal shower where you have a thermostat mixer and you just choose how cold or hot you want your water to be and it comes out at a nice pressure and you get to have a nice relaxing shower if you want to. However, here in the UK, those aren't that common and instead the most common type of showers there are are electric showers. So that, it's just basically a box that has a resistance inside that heats up cold water as it goes through it. The way it works is that, and here's where the problem with electric showers lie, is that in order to have more hot water, you get less water because when it heats it up at the resistance, it takes longer to heat up, like it, it spends longer there at the resistance and so it heats up more and you get hot water but you get really low flow of hot water. If you want cold water or colder water, what the shower does, it lets more water through, so it doesn't spend as much time as the resistance, so it doesn't get as hot, and you get a lot more water coming through, but it's colder. Just so you get an idea of what I'm talking about when I said that there's a very low flow of hot water, here's a video of our electric shower. Here's our electric shower. As you can see, that's the electric shower. And this is the water pressure you get with hot water. Well, water flow, water pressure. It's um, it's sad to be honest. If that doesn't seem that bad in a video, it's one because you haven't been under that water trying to wash this amount of hair or any amount of hair to be honest, and um, because you haven't recently, maybe you haven't recently seen or like literally just seen a normal mixer shower working. So here's our normal mixer shower. This is very loud and it's our normal shower and as you can see there's quite a difference between both of them. When we first moved into our place, into this flat, we didn't have that mixer shower, we only had the electric one and we constantly, we were constantly telling the rental agency that we couldn't shower with it and we eventually annoyed them enough so that they installed a mixer shower and we shut up. and. That's been going great so far, actually. We were happy with it. So why, if electric showers have such low power and mixer showers are so used around the world, why are they so common here in the UK? That is because UK houses are old and they have different plumbing systems than modern or other houses in the world. Um, this is just the way it is. Nowadays, however, most houses have what's called a combi boiler, which works perfectly with mixer showers. The way a combi boiler works is that it heats up water that goes directly into your radiator so you don't freeze overnight, and water that goes directly into your mixer shower so you have a nice relaxing hot shower. Good, everyone's happy with that. However, British houses, as I've said, they're old, they have a different plumbing system, and instead, before they had combi boilers, what they had was uh, were older boilers like system boilers. These boilers, the way they worked was that they heated up water that went directly into your radiator so you don't freeze over night, and they heated up water that instead of going to your would-be mixer shower, went into a hot water tank, which is just a tank that was filled with cold water that got heated up with the boiler by the boiler, and remained full until you used up all the hot water. The problem with this is that that hot water would remain static, it wouldn't move, and that led to other problems that I will talk about later. 
and that it made it, the plumbing just made it very difficult to have a mixer shower and control the temperature. So instead of using that mixer shower, what British people did was like, here's a box that heats up water as you use it. Problem solved. And in theory, it's a great idea to have a electric shower, but in practice, you get a very low flow of water. You can arrange, you can fix that by getting a power pump, but that means you're going to waste a lot more water and it's not going to be as cost effective as it would ideally be, or as a mixer shower would be. Also in the long run, electricity tends to cost more than gas. So honestly, mixer showers are, I think they're best. I really prefer them. They're better. But electric showers are, are most common here. So when you're looking for a flat, once you are out of uni accommodation, you should really look into what kind of showers they have and maybe talk with the person who's showing you the flat if there would be a possibility of having a mixed shower if you, as I said, have long hair or would really like, you know, to have a decent shower with decent fall and pressure. Second thing I want to talk about is still in the bathrooms or, well, actually, it's out of the bathroom and that's my, that's the thing. It's electric switches or, yeah, light switches and plugs. Power box. They are not in the bathrooms here. There's no way you're gonna find one. And that's because of safety regulations. This country is really all about protecting its people from stupid deaths, honestly. Not really things. The reason why electric switch, uh, light switches, or other kind of switches, or literally any kind of electric plug, can be in the bathroom is because obviously water and electricity don't meet, but they're there in case you are in your bathtub and for some reason you decide to either turn off the light fun or you decide to plug or unplug I don't know your phone charger your hair dryer while you're soaking wet in the shower or in the bathtub so yeah that's the reason why anyway it's not in Spain, you don't have light switches inside the bathroom, but you do have plugs for like your hair dryer or if you want to shave for your shaving machine thingy. But in here, you don't really get that. And it's just a tiny bit annoying not, be able, not being able to dry my hair in the bathtub. In the bathtub. See, that's why it, that's what the law is there for, to protect people like me um, in the bathroom. But it's just mildly inconvenient. It's just something that kind of shocked me when I got here. Next thing, still in the bathroom. And another thing, and uh, the reason behind this is, again, to protect people from doing stupid things and dying by doing so. When you come to the UK, you will see, in mostly all public bathrooms and all bathrooms everywhere, that you have either the chance to wash your hands with boiling water or freezing water. You don't get an in-between, you don't get one uh, tap that changes between hot and cold water. You either boil your hands for a while, then quickly stick them into the freezing water, or vice versa. It's just quite difficult to actually wash your hands. You really do feel that now with the coronavirus too. It's uh, something that really comes to mind. Anyway, the reason why this is the way this is is because, as I said before, hot water used to be stored in a cylinder, in a hot water tank. It would remain stationary and that would mean and that meant that either the tank could rust or there could be dead rats or very many dead animals in there because those hot water tanks are actually inside the lofts inside lofts here inside your own house so if you had any mice or something they would go for the warmth and they would die and that means contaminated water and people would mix hot and cold water and drink it and die and that's not good Speaking of protecting the people and safety regulations. One thing I didn't know anything about and was actually a real problem trying to rent a flat after my first year at uni was HMO properties. What is an HMO property? You may ask yourself if you're not from the UK. An HMO property is uh, means a house in multiple occupation. That means a house in which common areas such as the kitchen or the bathrooms or the living room are shared by more than one household. What is defined as a household? One household is defined as people who live together as a family. That means either 
you with your parents, you with your sisters or siblings, or you and your spouse, or, and this is where it gets weird, in a sense, you and your partner who are not married, you are just living together, so you could move in with your girlfriend or boyfriend of two months and say you're living as a household, as a family. The deal with HMO properties is that they are, they have special things that make them safer for the people living in there as they aren't from the same family, they're not related, I'm, it just makes it safer to live there. So these things include safety measures such as fire doors, which are really heavy doors that close on their own and you can't tamper with them and there's no way to stop them closing it, you can't put a door stop underneath, you're not allowed to do so. So you open the door, I'll show you a video of how annoying it is. I'm holding open my bedroom door right now, that's the closing system it has. And as you can see it's quite a thick door and it's also quite heavy so I'm just gonna let go. And um, yeah. So that was the door that eventually gets very annoying when you need to like close the door quickly or you don't want to make a lot of noise or you're in a hurry and you just don't want to wake up everyone at 8 a.m. when you're in your way to work. It's just, it's just annoying. It's an annoying measure, but it's supposed to protect us from a fire, which I guess is good. You don't want to die. Other things, other safety measures is that in houses like ours that ha are divided in two floors, or one, two floors, two or more floors, sorry, is that you need to have a fire extinguisher in every floor. So actually we have a fire extinguisher in our kitchen and there's one in the hallway upstairs. And there also needs to be a fire blanket in the kitchen in case of a fire in the stove just so it doesn't spread and you don't burn yourself and you can do something about it before it burns down your house and you are homeless in the streets crying and dying. Fun. Use that fire blanket. It's there for something. Another weird thing that uh, there's here is adequate emergency lighting. And that means green lights, which are always on in the hallways. That way at least you don't trip when you're walking in the dark in your hallway. You don't trip because there's always a green light there. But they turn on when and they're like cold light. Once the if the lights goes off, you get the emergency light thing on, and that's just a cool thing to have. Honestly, I like that. Um, the worst thing, honestly, in my opinion, it's supposed to be the safest thing. It does make sense to have it, but it's also incredibly annoying. Are fire alarms and weekly fire alarm testing. Every room in our house has got a fire alarm. Got one here in my bedroom, there's one in the kitchen, there's two or three in the hallway, there's one in the labor room, and they're all there to protect us in case there's any smoke. They go off, and they go off so loudly, and so often, because we need to test it every week. It's just horrible, it's honestly horrible, and I don't like it, and if you're staying in university accommodation when you come here, be prepared to every week, if you're there in your university accommodation, to hear the fire alarm go off because they're testing it and it's gonna be like that every single week. And it's gonna surprise you every single week and it's gonna be hell every single week, you just don't get used to it. But it's, again, it's there for our safety. This is gonna be the last weird thing about Buddhist houses, at least it was the last that I can think about. And it's that in a country, known for its grey skies, constant raining and humidity. There are no functional dryers in most British houses. They just aren't. British houses are old, there just isn't enough space for to have a separate washer and a dryer. So most houses directly don't have any type of washing or drying element for your clothes or have a coming of a have a washer slash dryer which washes your clothes, but doesn't really dry your clothes. So you're left with drying your clothes out and about in your hallway or your garden. If you do have one, you just put it on a clothes rack and leave it there to dry and you'll probably be able to get them, I don't know, two or three days afterwards because it's just that humid here. And it's also when it's cold in the winter, it's horrible to leave your clothes out because they are damp and cold and you don't actually know if they're really damp or if they're just cold or just not nice. You can put them in your, if you have a washer dryer, you can put them in there. But honestly, 
you're just gonna take them out and hang them somewhere in the end. It doesn't make your house look pretty either, having your clothes all around if you share an apartment with other people like we do, you've got five mates, you are not gonna let your underwear on the sofa, you're not really gonna let your t-shirts either on the sofa, so you're gonna have to somehow cramp all of your clothes in your bathroom. And it's just a mess. I like living in a tidy space. So having to hang my clothes around my room doesn't really, I don't really like it. So I need to leave them there for a while until they're properly dry. And then obviously you have to iron them. Fun, fun, fun. Next thing is public transport. It is expensive, really expensive. London is an exception. So I'm not going to talk about London because I'm not in London. I'm in Scotland, couldn't be farther away. But here and in the rest of the UK, public transport is so expensive. It's not uh, government funded. It's not. It's uh, privately owned. There are few major companies that run buses, and they are free to set their prices as they want, which means expensive public transport. So that you get an idea in the city I live in, which is primarily a student city. So you would kind of guess that prices are cheaper and stuff, so that students can live in there. Well. For a three bus stop ride on the bus, it's 180 quid. That's a five minute journey. So if you would just wanna move a couple of bus stops because it's pouring outside and you don't wanna get wet, you have to pay 180, it's horrible. You can obviously not use public transport and get wet, carry your grocery bags or heavy wax, whatever, and walk for a while. But there's some times that you can't avoid using public transport. For example, when you go to work. I do not work in the city I live in. I work in the next city over. That's like half, a, yeah, half an hour away from here on the bus. So it's not a long journey, not at all. But it is expensive. If you don't have a student card, a return trip is £10. £10. That's, that's just... That's just so expensive. It just it just doesn't appear in my head. I just don't understand how it can be so expensive. In Madrid, if you qualify for it and you're on the 26, that's one of the uh, requirements, you can get all of public buses, underground, train, tram, everything, in the whole province of Madrid, not just the capital, the whole province, for 20 euros a month. Unlimited bus, train, underground travel for 20 euros a month that's just and here then you have 10 pounds just to get to and from a city that's half an hour away from you that's just it doesn't even get better when you have a student car i mean it's seven pounds for a return trip with student car but as i said i work there and my a minimum wage is six something for people aged between 18 and 21. So that means it's more expensive for me to get to work than what I earn in an hour. And that's just, that just baffles me. And that's just the way it is here in the UK. And people complain that public transport is very expensive. And honestly, the price has risen at least three times since I came here last year. Public transport has just gotten more expensive. And that's something that you need to take in mind when you're moving here to the UK. Try to get your accommodation as closely as possible to everything because public transport is going to be expensive if you're going to use it. While we're on the topic of transport, I feel like the UK has got the perfect combination of things to make you fear for your life when you're either in a car or on the bus or you're crossing the street. What I mean with this is that maybe it's just my impression, maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like uh, speed limits are considerably higher than they are in Spain. People just drive faster, and that's a bit scary. Cause, um, lots of roads here are quite narrow. If you're not in the city, or even if you're in a city, roads are just narrow. They're all, and there's a lot of two-way traffic, obviously, so you have to be careful when crossing the streets. But also, if you're out at night, and you're, say, on a bus, or you're driving somewhere, or someone's giving you a ride, and you're not in the city, or in a city or in a town, you're going from town to town. At least here in Scotland, from the places I've been to, there aren't many street lights along the road, so it's incredibly dark in a very narrow road with people going very fast, and it's just quite scary to be honest. I fear for my life. It just makes me very nervous to be on the car or on the bus because buses go incredibly crazy, and people have actually mentioned that to me. 
like I've taken, I've been, I've spoken with people on on the phone and like show them around the video call how public transport here is and the scenery because it's very green, it's very pretty. And <laughs> but one of the things that I've been told the most is, wow, that bus is going really fast. I'm like yeah, that's what they do here. Everyone goes very fast. It's not just the bus; it's everyone. And it can be a bit scary, to be honest. You know, no lights, narrow road, everyone's going very fast. Not really my thing. Another thing to consider here, and that really impressed me or shocked me, is that there are barely any crossing points. Like, there's literally just enough for you to cross the street. But, like, if, you want, if you're in a large street, like a long street, there's probably just going to be two crossing points, one at the beginning and one at the end. So you're either left with walking all the street up and down or just risking and crossing on the street that's why i also i'm quite scared of like cars and stuff and that's when i'm talking about it because you sometimes are just just don't have any other option than to cross the street when there isn't a crossing point and also they're hard to recognize sometimes when i first came here in edinburgh i arrived in edinburgh and there they're easy to recognize now that i know how to look out for them but they're just obviously painted on the floor and they have, um, it's a, it's a light, like a, it's just a lamp that's yellow and goes on and off and on and off. And that's just what tells you that there's a street light there. You don't really see the stoplight. You just see that yellow blinking light. And that's, a, that's the most obvious, easy to spot crossing point. Here, just right next to my home, there's a crossing point that isn't, that doesn't even have the, zebra stripes on the road it's just indicated by a blue sign that has an arrow and that means that people can cross there cars do not have to stop for you you have to wait until someone's very nice and kind of let you uh, cross or until there are no cars and you just cross as if there wasn't actually a crossing point there i know this is getting long but hear me out i'm on my last point and last but not least Measurements here in the UK. Officially, the UK uses the metric system. That means it's very nice and simple. It's what everyone's learned here in the U in European Union. So you would expect road signs to be in kilometers per hour. But no, they're in miles per hour. So good luck figuring that one out. Speed limit, 55. 55 what? You just arrive here, you don't know. You know that the UK uses the metric system because it was in the European Union. And you read 55 and you're like... Is that kilometers? Is that miles per hour? What? But yeah, it's miles per hour, just so you know. I was shocked to find... I was very confused at first. I was like, is that kilometers? Because that sounds like very low for me to be like almost in the highway. That's not the only confusing thing here. They just don't stick to the metric system. I guess that's where America got it from, where the United States got it from. Um, Like most people, if you ask them about things in kilograms and meters and stuff, they will answer you with that. But if you don't, you don't specify, they will tell you that the bowling alley is one mile away. And you're like, okay, that doesn't mean anything to me. I'm sorry. I don't know how far that is. I... Okay, thank you, I guess. Um, if you ask them about the way, their weight or something's weight, they will probably answer you in pounds. They will answer you in kilograms if you're very lucky. They will answer you in pounds if you're lucky. And they will answer you in stones if you're unlucky. How much is a stone? One stone is six kilograms, I think. That's the correct measurement. Um, yeah, I asked a co-worker how much a box weighed in. And he was like, oh, this many stones. And I was like, excuse me, what? Stones? Why are you using stones? How am I supposed to know what a stone weighs what? It was just confusing, as are most things here. And if you ask someone for the height, they will probably tell you that they're 5 feet or 5 feet 1. Or It actually depends on the height. It really depends. But I've heard people tell me centimeters and feet just the same. Okay, so I know those were quite a few things, mostly related with the house. Um, UK houses and that's because well we're stuck at home and they were things that were mildly inconvenient at first and they're still mildly inconvenient but now that we're stuck at home they just keep piling up so I thought 
yeah, why not talk about it to other people, and especially people who might be in the midst of making a decision right now, coming to UK, maybe not, or whatever coronavirus lets us do in the future. And um, just for people who, just so, uh, these are things that I wish I had known before I came to the UK, um, just so that I wouldn't be as surprised as I was when I came here. If I had known these things, I probably would have been more prepared to deal with them and not complain as much as I have about them, to be honest. Uh, it's just, I just thought it was nice for other people to let other people know about these things. I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you soon or you'll see me soon in any other videos I will be posting. Thank you for watching. Bye bye.